Hi and welcome to today's uh, pre-practical video on the polymerase chain reaction or more commonly known PCR reaction. So this PCR reaction essentially is a technique that was um, discovered or developed in the early 1980s by Carrie Mullis and it transformed molecular biology and it's something that you're going to get the chance to set up and run in today's session. So this video will give you an outline of the key principles and afterwards we'll have a short quiz that you'll be able to complete to test your knowledge and understanding. So I hope you enjoy the, the overview that we're going to look at now. Here we're looking at a piece of double-stranded DNA, two single strands held together by hydrogen bonding between complementary base pairs. Now imagine there is a piece of that DNA that you want to get lots of copies of. Not the whole piece, but just a particular region, a target region, which is indicated here by the red box. And essentially what we want to do is make lots of copies of just this target region and that's what PCR can do via the use and implementation of three stages. These three stages are known as denaturation, annealing and extension. The first of these stages is denaturation and this occurs at 95 degrees Celsius. Hydrogen bonds are we're keeping the double strands together, but now with this input of heat, we are breaking the hydrogen bonds and separating the DNA into two single strands. The second stage is known as primer annealing, and it occurs at 55 degrees Celsius. But this sometimes can vary based on the primers that you introduce into the reaction. And essentially, primers are single-stranded pieces of DNA indicated here in blue, and they are complementary to the target region. So you design these and you specify the sequence that will be in the primer so that it will hydrogen bond with the target region so that the primer will bind, one primer will bind to each strand and you specify that. That way you actually indicate what area you want to be amplified. In the next stage, the enzyme that's going to do the work is known as TAC DNA polymerase. And that TAC comes from Thermus aquaticus the thermophile that produces this particular protein that's very thermostable and works at high temperatures, which suits PCR. So I'm just indicating here, you can see the red circle, that it's going to bind and extend in the, the three prime end of the primer. We're going to see that happen in the next phase, which is known as the extension phase. In this last phase of PCR, which occurs at 72 degrees Celsius, which is the optimum temperature for TAC DNA polymerase to work, TAC DNA polymerase extends the primer on, from the three prime end in that five prime to three prime direction, generating a new strand of DNA, new piece of DNA. So you can see that by this green arrow that's indicated on the, the slide here. So if, for example, the TAC polymerase was here and it, it would read the template, if it sees a G, it puts a C, if it sees a C, it puts a G, and so on. And it'll build a strand complementary to that uh, template strand that's present and likewise the same thing happens on the the other strand so essentially we're being left with two copies of the original sequence and when i say the original sequence i mean the target sequence that we indicated with a red box at the very start of this sketch and as you can see here we now have two copies of that original target sequence so what we've seen is one cycle of PCR, denature, anneal, extend. But really what we would produce in one reaction is 30 to 35 cycles worth of a, a reaction. So essentially we go through that cycle 30 to 35 times. And as you can see from what we did, we got two copies of our initial copy from one cycle. But you can I identify with these numbers that every time you go through it, we double each time. So after 30, 35 cycles, you would have amplified millions of copies of that target region in a very short space of time. A big threat for any researcher performing a PCR reaction is contamination. It can ruin your experiment completely and even give you false results. So it's essential we build in controls. Uh, you'll have seen in the manual um, and you'll also see in the lab itself we'll be performing a negative control and it's vital that this is performed for every single PCR reaction to ensure there's no contamination of any of the reagents. It's vital that we integrate ways to minimize the contamination. So for example, in an undergraduate laboratory, gloves. We need to make sure we have gloves at all times when we're working with molecular biology. We don't leave tubes open on the bench for very long. We have to be very careful of 
um, contamination with pipettes, for example, that we change tip every single time so that we're not cross-contaminating different reagents. We have to be very careful that all our reagents are autoclaved before use. Taking these on board, in addition to cleaning your bench maybe with ethanol before you use any of the, the equipment or the reagents, these things will help minimize your contamination risk. So I hope that's given you an overview of the PCR technique. This technique has transformed molecular biology and it's evolved from its development stage in the early 80s into such high-end applications. And you'll be learning about those in lectures and other laboratory sessions this semester. So now it's your, uh, you've come to the point where it's your turn to complete the quiz. It's a short quiz and I'd ask you to do your best and get the highest mark you can. And we'll be able to go through the answers when we are in the practical session and hopefully that's given you an overview of the technique and you're well prepared for your session later today and this week. Best of luck.